it is repetition which makes for perfection. So with watercolor, a couple things. You want to get, let's review the, the material. So you got this. So these are small pigments, but you can see that they have quite a punch. They pack a punch. Uh, I, I think this is for mixing colors, this area over here. I hope so. So this is critical. If you're going to work with watercolors, uh, you can work on regular sort of rough board, uh, but it'll start to warp. The water uh, affects it, right? So this paper, it's a little pricey, but it's worth it. You got to get it. It's, uh, I mean, you can get any brand, but this, this one is Arches. And so if you look around the edge here, you see a black, it's black. Okay, and it's almost like a black tar. Uh, adhesive runs around the whole edge. It basically glues the paper down to the sheets underneath. There's like five sheets. You can't really see it from the camera, but there's five black sheets here and they're stacked and they're basically glued around the edge. So as I put water on this and watercolor, it doesn't buckle, it stays flat. And then when I'm done and it's dried, you pull it off, you basically kind of tear it off this block and the, and the uh, original is flat. At any time, if you take the, this off the block and then apply water, it will buckle. So basically, you keep it on this until it dries. Once it dries, the paper sort of uh, has physical memory, I guess. Um, and once it's dried, it's locked in that shape. So it's really interesting. If you don't do it this way, the way I was taught is you take board, you, you tape it down, to, like paper down to like wooden board, you tape the edges down just like this, and then you put the watercolor in, um, and it may buckle and stuff, but then it will like flatten out because it's tape. Basically, you have to hold it in place. So in my head, I've kind of penciled out the dark areas. This is gonna be mostly black with a little bit of face peeking through. Uh, and then the, the cape will be black. And then there's a bunch of bats that go around. So the idea is at the end, it's this lightning bolt, which I'll reinforce with whiteout. And you're just going to see the highlights. It's it's going to be a mostly kind of black ominous figure coming at you. So let's let's see let's see what happens. Oh, so in terms of applying watercolor, there's three kind of different ways. I think there's three. I'm sure there's a lot more than three, but here's the three I'm going to show you guys. Right. So uh, all right. So step one. That already had some color loaded in there. So step one is uh, here's here's one way, which is is. Uh, Put the water down where you want it to. It's colored so you can see it. But normally I would do it clearly. And uh, you want to put a fair amount of water to kind of load it up so that the water sits on top of the paper. If you wait a second, it gets absorbed in there so you get different effects. But, but watercolor is not just about color and value, which is what you'd normally be dealing with if you were painting something in acrylic, but it's also about, it's a little bit about chemistry, I think, uh, or physics in that when you, how you apply it to the board gives, gives you different results. Okay, so let me give you some examples. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to show you examples. But, um, so for example, you can load water down and then put pigment in the water and then the pigment kind of spreads and forms these really cool patterns uh, and you don't get a, an even covering. If you want something kind of flat that looks more like an acrylic uh, coat of paint, you have to kind of create the, the paint using watercolor and water off to the side, get it to the density you want and then apply it just like an acrylic so it can kind of work that way too. Or you can um, load color onto color which is kind of cool like like some of the stuff there and you get some really there's a lot you have to kind of really count on serendipity you have to really count on just random things happening that you can't necessarily control that's part of watercolor and and then the other thing i'll just share with you guys because it's a lesson i've learned uh in all the 10 pieces that i've done um using white the whiteboard as an element is hyper critical like I found that the ones I like the best are the ones where I haven't filled in every bit of white with color, where I let the white kind of shine through. So this is going to be white down here. That's kind of what I've already figured out. So now that I've kind of filled up all this with, with water, it's kind of hard to tell, especially since I'm doing it off screen. Okay, 
And now I'm going to go with Payne's Gray, which is like that blue gray. And you'll watch if I just drop it in here. See how that kind of spreads out. And you can accelerate it by turning it upside down. But it pretty much will go where the water is. Okay, so you kind of want to, so you can paint with it up to the line or you can just dab it into the water and then it slowly will kind of branch out. It forms all these really amazing capillaries, right? You can see, I don't know if you can see that. Like, I, I love the, uh, the wet look of watercolor. It gets a little, I get the colors are so vibrant and the textures are amazing, that slick surface. And then when it dries, it actually dries lighter right uh, which is a different which is different than like say uh, acrylic which which dries darker so the the colors you can get at the end are um, lighter than what you put down and the patterns the capillaries all that stuff kind of gets smoothed out and um, less interesting look looking in my opinion so watercolors to me like right at this point are like this is where it's super exciting so then if you put more water, it basically will kind of pull that color in there. So you can get you can get, kind of get these washes. So you can get a, a very sort of smooth gradient there, or you can do something like this where when it dries, it's, it's going to give you kind of a harsher cut, but also a little more uh, random looking, a little more artistic and less literal, I guess, right? All right, so you can sort of see. So with this... <clears throat> They say you should do light to dark uh, in watercolor. So you start with the lighter values and then you go to darker values. And uh, I, I went to a pretty dark one right there just because that's the background. I kind of want to sort of, I know it's going to have a certain color. So, um, and so to get it darker, you can just load in more pigment here. Oops. All right, let me just show you how that goes. All right, so I'm literally just dipping in there, getting a bunch of pigment or paint on there this landed correctly and then I'm just gonna go in and kind of paint the edges and the board you can see is already kind of drying and so this the ink doesn't spread as fast So because the board's already wet, uh, you get less of that pronounced line right there. If you didn't do it with wet board, uh, you put a stroke down, then you put some more pigment, and you might run into like being able to see the line that you just kind of put down. Okay, so load some more ink in there. Basically, the the pigment will run up to the edge of the water you put unless you put a lot of water and then it'll beat up and then run over and you'll get like this basic uh, sort of streak mark which you don't want so it's kind of also knowing being able to control your liquor control your liquid <laughs> right and uh, a lot of it is kind of the angle you hold it the amount of water on there so that's kind of where trial and error comes into to play just like, as I say, do it, uh, get some board, know you're gonna make mistakes, start experimenting and seeing kind of the, the, the results you get. And what's so weird or frustrating with watercolor, I think, is that you, you get something like this, you go like, that's perfect, and then when it dries, it looks so different. Um, so there's that piece of it as well. Now I'm kind of doing like a, <clears throat> instead of going completely flat or gray in, in the shape back here, I'm going to go darker up there, lighter down here. It's almost like the light's kind of casting a shadow right there. So it's still gray here, but there's that cast shadow. And so I can actually, you know, that's the question is like, how much do I work on making this cape three-dimensional versus just a sort of a flat graphical element in the background, right? Okay, 
and the thing about this is it's fast. Um, I mean, it's taken me days since I started just because I'm working on other things. Uh, Fandom in particular is a huge priority. All right, so in this time, I've already loaded up the, the paint, so it's more like acrylic, so there's no pre-water underneath here, right? So you can see how it just kind of stays in the lane, and maybe if I kind of play around with the side, push it down, I get a little bit of a dry brush. But you can see it's much more traditional in that it's dark, and then it gets lighter as I kind of pull out from it, as there's, right? So you can kind of compare and contrast, as they say. In English so you can just keep doing that so that's the second way of applying pigment okay now the fun thing is you can do this now load it up more water and then pull the water out of what you've just done and again use that water as the medium it basically grabs the paint and pulls it you know through uh, surface tension pulls the pigment towards itself it flattens everything out so if you want something flat you put the water evenly across you know but if you want something that has a little like personality to it like that those lines there that's where you drop pigment into water and just let it kind of do its own thing and you just get results you wouldn't you really can't do manually right you couldn't create something that looked that chaotic, I guess, in, in terms of its structure. And this is going to have some rain and splatter and all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, and that kind of leans into the fun of doing watercolor and just making it feel very kind of expressive. It's nice to leave little white areas. You can always fill them in with color later. But again, the, the white elements really pop and, and really, uh, I think, make watercolors look exciting. So the more you can use the white of the paper in your design, the better. So I've got this bluish gray that I'm going to use for the, for the cape. Uh, I might do more of a greenish gray for the costume, like because it's a primarily a gray costume. Or some other gray that, that has a color kind of mixed in. So so there's there's the wet and wet I was talking about before. All right, if you want to create that hard line, you go to the edge and then you let go. See how that goes. And if you point it down like that, it does different things. It's good to have tissue blotting paper if the water kind of blobs up too much. But see how this <clears throat> basically, uh, because I put the pigment around the edges, it looks a little artificial, like there's a dark line and lightness, so I need to kind of balance that out a little bit here. Okay. And I'm also looking at the whole piece, making sure it looks consistent. Right, this looks darker than here because it's more wet. And then I'm going to go ahead and go dark in here. Oop, there's water right there. See that water bead thing running? So when it connects over, over here, it's going to do something very different. I guess you can get, um, okay, so that's the second way, right? Just applying kind of direct pigment. There's actually four ways. So the third way is wet on wet, right? So if you got this here and I wanted to add some color, I put it here, the colors would mix kind of across just sort of through diffusion. And then the last one is uh, doing glazes, right? Where you put like a light blue for shadows on the face. You let that completely dry and then you go in with like a flesh tone and you put that over and so it's a building up of color but for that to work uh, effectively you gotta let that first layer dry otherwise you get that wet on wet look right so dry application wet application 
whether you load the paper in advance with water or not, all these things have um, an impact, right? Let's play around with this dark green that I unboxed or opened up earlier today. There's a little bit of dark green over here. Put it over here. Can I see that hue? Now, what happens if I mix it with a little bit of uh, Payne's gray? It looks pretty dark. But I'm going to make a lot of it because I'm going to need a lot of this kind of core pigment. So I'm basically, I've got like a little bit of like a hole, like a little well. I'm just basically pulling over as much of the concentrated pigment as, as possible. And I wipe it here to again pull the liquid off the brush. Now I'm going to get this dark green. You can see this dark green over here. Can you see it? Mixing it in. And let's grab a little bit of this kind of more olive green over here. See that over there? It's hard to tell on the camera, I think, in this lighting, but this green is different from this. This is more intense, a little more electric. This is a little more woodsy and traditional olive drab green. Forest green, I guess. So now I'm going to mix it all together. Load it up with water and let's see what I can do and see how it looks. If it looks too green, I'm going to have to pull in a little bit more of this. All right. So it's a pretty loaded brush with the pigment. Let's see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and do the um, I'm going to do the shadows first. And because it's uh, fairly concentrated, you can see that's not running. All right, if it were uh, more loaded up, which I'm going to do now, I'm going to put some water in to kind of extend it. Some muscular structure there, and I'm just doing the shadows. Um, let's do the rib cage here. It's a little odd to me that it's green gray and blue gray there. Um, but I can always adjust it later if I feel funny about it. I was just trying to see what happens if I use different grays. I guess this is the tricky part of it. At, if you're watching it, <clears throat> I don't know if you could see the grays underneath. But I'm drawing with the, the paint, right? Um, and that requires kind of having a knowledge of where these shadows might run or, or what actually makes it look like the shadows are running, right? So let's see what happens. I can already tell that this isn't dark enough for the face, especially. But this is the first coat, so to speak. First pass at it. In fact, once I put this. Um, once you put the water down, it forms uh, like a moat or a sort of jigsaw piece puzzle. So if I load pigment into the shape that I've just created, it will pretty much just stay in that area unless I load it up with a ton of water. All right, so I've kind of figured out where I want the shadow to be on the face. So now if I want it to be darker, 
can just kind of load it up here at the top. Let gravity do its thing. I can accelerate that gravity by just loading up a little water. And again, as long as the water doesn't get too high to go over the sort of the moat walls, the surface tension of the original outline, it won't go in and mess up my the red shapes I've already put in there. All right. And I'm going to tighten that up with ink anyway. See how that works there. The thing about watercolor is that it's very impressionistic, right? It gives you the um, feeling of something. And so the less literal you are with it, the less you're trying to draw something bound by a line, the more um, successful I think it ends up being. All right. Kind of that diffuse kind of shape then I want to kind of meld into the section on the um so all right you can look at it's just like it looks a little flatter. It's not as smooth. So you're getting different results. You can see the pigment kind of form up here. That transition is probably too stark. Um, when, when there's that much pigment on the paper, you can just put water and just like slowly kind of make the pigment. You can reintroduce it into the liquid state. It's pretty cool. All right, so let's, uh, let's move through here quickly. I'm rethinking this whole green gray, blue, gray. Green is a warmer color, right? Warm colors are red, yellow, green, orange. Green's kind of in the middle. And then when you get to blue, uh, purple, uh, those are traditionally cooler colors, right? And so they kind of just have to, it's like another tool in the chest, right? When you're working in color is organizing your warm and cool colors. Now I love stuff like that. It looks like a, um, pure ink line and then you can you can see the graduation it's not super clean on the edge it looks very hand done and uh, that's like I love that kind of stuff in both inking and watercolor so you can see this foot I meant to make this foot here uh, mostly black so you outline it and then you fill it in darkest values at the top. And what I might do actually is uh, at the end when this all dries, I might go in with like a blue glaze and hit it all. The best way to have done that actually is using an airbrush after it's all dry. Like you can go with the airbrush and just... So you can sort of see this is the first round of shadows. Uh, it's hard to see the, what I did here in um, pencil, but also recognize that uh, the brush is pretty loaded and I am just kind of going in and sometimes the shapes I get aren't necessarily the ones I want, but that's what I'm trying to do, which is introduce a little bit of uh, random, randomness into uh, what I'm drawing. Right. So some lines I know for sure, but when I get to sorry, when I get to things like these muscles, sometimes it's just kind of cool to lay down a blob and see what happens. So this is the first round, and uh, I, I'm trying to get pre pretty close to what I want the um, so you can see that ink trying to cross over that red. I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to just change the angle of this. So some of the stuff is just kind of paying attention to where things are. But the goal here is to um, get the first pass of shapes, and then you can keep adjusting the, um, the values 
as you kind of go through and do more of it. All right. So there's going to be other layers. And it's a little scary, honestly, because uh, it never looks right to me until the very, very end. And I guess the same could be true for pencil and ink drawings, but I guess I just have done so many of them that I kind of know how it ends. Here I'm just doing the shadows in between the, the fingers rather than trying to do something with the fingers. Alright, see how much darker that is? That's kind of ultimately where how dark I want it to be over here. A lot of times I load up the ink, uh, the pigment at the top of a shadow, and then let uh, gravity, or if I want to hasten gravity, I just put liquid below the line like that. You can sort of see how it just kind of starts dragging it down. All right, so instead of cross hatching, you go dark up here, and then it's going to go lighter down here. And I can do that by just introducing some water down here and then connecting the two friends up right there. And don't worry if like the first, like, but you can see the water's kind of growing into the crotch and it's forming its own crystal shape here. So you gotta just be careful. Uh, but d don't worry too much if the first time you do this that the pigments uh, aren't doing what you want, or that the water's flowing over, you get all these drips and things like that. That's just, again, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit like a video game, all right? There's a physical uh, hand-eye coordination, just muscle memory that goes on. Let's go ahead and do this hand here, because I want to close out all the shadows. I think that's the last shadow that I got. Let's just say this whole arm is going to throw a shadow across this body here. Now it should start looking right to you like uh, as you do more and more of this, as I lay in more uh, shadows, uh, it starts looking like something that's really super high contrast, right? Uh, the forms, right? If you squint at this, it should look like a figure jumping through a lightning storm. Acrylic. So it wouldn't be quite oil, but it's pretty close. I just like it because it's just a lot easier to clean up afterwards. Okay, so I have this, uh, so there is a way to kind of speed things along, hair dryer, you can take this. So you see that blob of paint at the bottom of the thigh, All right, this one here, if I let it dry, it'll be dark there. If I, if I tilt it up like this, I'll, it'll dry more flat, All right, but if it's like that, it's going to be darker at the bottom. You can see it pulling down there, right? If I do that, it's going to dry more flat. So for the time being, I'm going to go flat just because I can always make it darker later. And so I'm going to hit it up like this. So you want to be careful. You want to be careful <laughs> that the uh, air doesn't blow streaks into the watercolors, unless that's what you want. So here's my analysis of what I have so far. Core shadows are down, um, but what I really need uh, is to control the amount of white areas that I have. 
on most paintings, the white areas will pop the most. So you want to figure out exactly, and, and it'll attract, you know, so the shape of the eye, and vice versa. Look, if it's all white and you have a, a black shape, boom, your eye's going to go to that black shape. So considering that most of it's painted, now I really have to figure out where I want the eye to go, which is like here, right? And if, and if that's the case, everything needs to get a little, like, I don't mind this being white here, but as it gets, I just want a little more consistency across. So I, I kind of want to bring this Payne's gray and do a, a glaze on top of everything, right? So that's not going to be white. That's not going to be white, right? There might be a white highlight across the top, but now that's kind of where I'm going. I want to get a wider brush. Can you see that? And I really try to figure out where it is that the um, the, the white areas. So. there. The idea is to have this arm on this side kind of blend into the shadows that are here. So I'm going to darken this area altogether. Having shapes come out of darkness, uh, these shadows is it, it's very dramatic looking, and that's the kind of the fun of of this to me at least is creating something that looks structural but without necessarily a lot of structure. Or anything. I'm going to keep the green in here to make this kind of pop out. All right, so it's a black on black effect or dark on dark effect, but using different colors, slightly different values to make it pop even though it should flatten out. to see at this angle but I need to do it like this so that uh So it's going to be Payne's gray at the top and it's going to fade out to like a gray green underneath. That's like the backlight. 
the idea behind it, I guess. And let's say that the core shadow I'm going for roughly is about there and here. And then we'll use water everywhere else to kind of I think with all things, um, color, especially watercolor acrylic, is uh, you know when you're trying to create a color palette, blending the colors together is a way of uniting the piece. So it's not just a bunch of different colors uh, that were uniquely generated, right, or that sit independent of each other. So having a little bit of this kind of Payne's gray in everything helps pull the piece together. This, you know, maybe it's it looks like I just overwrote everything there, but it's mostly liquid, and I'm counting on the stuff that's already dried underneath to kind of serve at or reappear as that kind of thin this out a little bit. into the cape underneath because I want this ultimately to kind of blend into the shape behind. I hope. I mean there's gonna be other bats so it's gonna be dark near the bottom unless I decide to forego the bats but Now you can't have too many wet areas where you're trying to direct the paint going on at once because then it's like one of those nightmare puzzles where you're trying to get like three balls into holes on, on the same plane all at once. So it is good every now and then to let it kind of dry and then you can tilt to your heart's content and not worry about other art kind of pull, like other colors pulling up and pooling up in strange areas that don't work for you. So bright. Some more Payne's gray. Kind of is mixing already with the, the red. It's picking it up. It's forming a purple kind of blob. Okay. And I'll do the same thing here. I want the red just to kind of peek through. It's going to be a dramatic bit of color that's going to be on the chest and the eyes for the most part. So I don't even really want the red down here to be super intense. Okay. To me, it's all stylistic, like how many areas that vibrate or vibrant on a piece that you want the eye to look at by closing down a lot of the white chunky areas down here I'm, I'm simplifying this and then there's going to be more detail up here when I go back in with white out. It looks a little like a study versus a final drawing and that's because um, when I paint I don't want to go too close to the line because I don't want to go over it. Um, so this is where I take like a marker and help kind of start 
breaking in the shapes of like where things are, but I don't want to outline it. So I don't want it to be like a line drawing that's colored in. So I want to do this in areas where it, you can't, it, it looks like a dark shadow versus a line, right? But this is where it gets uh, very critical. I gotta outline this this eye. I did, I put red in there deeper and farther than it needs to be. This is where a marker, you never want to trap the lines completely, but Yeah, just a little bit of a little dit and dat, little bits of shadow here and there, how it starts pulling the piece together. darkest values in here as well. Knowing that it's also going to lighten up when it dries. Then when I get to the the bat symbol on his chest, I will use either a marker or what dark watercolor. I think uh, Albert, my art rep, has it on on his site for sale. I'm pretty sure. I don't think I don't think we've sold it yet, but I don't know. To be honest, I don't track it that carefully. Still there, the rendering, the modeling, and it should be more apparent when it's all dry too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave a somewhat decent looking corpse, right? So pull it off at 70. And for those of you who feel like it's very appropriate for everything that we're going through as a society, 
and it's also kind of at the same time a testament to the human spirit, as they say, but also, well, let me let me share that last thought separately, but let me tell you, that, uh, for those, <clears throat> the show's called Alone, it's on the History Channel, it's, uh, I think they've got some of the seasons on Amazon Prime right now. It's about people that go into the deep wilderness, and uh, they've got like 10 items from a list of things that they're allowed to bring, um, but it's not a lot. You know, like fish hooks, nets, sleeping bags, pots, an axe. And they are um, all set up by themselves. Uh, so they record themselves. There's, so there's no crew around them. The, the, the team, the sh producers come in on a periodic basis to take their stats, like their BMIs, you know, blood pressure, all that kind of stuff. And they could be disqualified if it gets dangerously low. But it's kind of sick in a way, too, because it's a, it's a show about torture. It makes you really realize the importance of art and why art was created. Like, a lot of t like certainly when I was younger, like art was like, oh, it's just this frivolous thing. And it's nice pictures that we can hang it on our walls, and uh, you don't really need it. But if you watch that show, uh, it's pretty clear why society created art and why, out of that vacuum, artists were created and how important of a role they play. Because in this show, they're there for days, weeks, months, uh, and you realize, like the thing they say is like, it is so boring, there's nothing to do, right? It, survival is one thing, but it, you need more than that to survive, like mentally. And, and I feel like that's where self-expression and creating things that people can't create themselves and seeing that is, uh, it's refreshing to the soul. It's food for the soul. And, and you see really how important it is. At least that was my takeaway from it. Sorry, I'm doing this all below the screen. I need to pull back a little bit again. Even in this out a little bit. Hinting at things rather than drawing things. Big part of this. I'm using the same brush. Correct. And then I hide, kind of hide my tracks a little bit and to help blend it in. I just lay some water down and let water do the rest. See how that works? It's hard because of the the liquid. And I just love how dark and yeah, how dark that black looks and how deep and the layers and the translucence and the shimmering light coming off of it. When it dries it gets a little dull and boring. It's kind of a bummer. So I'm gonna stop this here. You will see this uh, piece on Instagram, my Instagram site later today when I finish it. But you can see, and I've chosen not to do the bats in the background. I think it would have made it too busy. The way I use this is, you know, think of this lightning bolt here. Think of this ear. I'm just moving this ear over by adding this highlight. All right, see how that works? And then if I want to do the mat. And so uh, it's really good if you have like pouches, you just basically hit the top part of the pouches to show the reflected light off the top. Yeah, maybe off 
the buckle here. And that's and that's how you kind of push and pull, right? You're you're adding shadow, you're pulling out light, adding shadow, pulling out light, and and as you constantly go back and forth in a painting, you're defining your shapes, and things start feeling less like blobs of blurry shadow and more like definite shapes that basically uh, fire the neurons in your eyes to make it. Go look like an arm or a kneecap versus a blob. I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. I know there's a lot of just insanity and craziness going around us everywhere, all around the world. So I feel like we're a little united in that, but um, hopefully um, this is kind of taking your mind off of it and maybe inspired you or motivated you to pick up some watercolors and play around with it. So thank you guys for stream, uh, tuning in for the stream. There will be announcement on the Discord channel when the next one is. I appreciate you guys supporting.